This is the first video in a series where I'll go over the setup and operation of the HTP Revolution 2500. In this particular video, we'll look at the physical setup of the machine as well as the user interface. On the rear of the machine, there are two separate gas fittings. The lower fitting connects to this European style MIG gun connector on the front. Using the included hose, connect it to the regulator and install that onto the proper shielding gas for the process you're running. With the gas opened all the way to the top, you'll be able to see the cylinder pressure and also see the flow rate and adjust that using the knob. The flow rate depends on a number of factors, but some good starting points based on process are listed here on the screen. The upper fitting is generally used for TIG welding and it connects to this fitting on the front here. It's also used for a spool gun when that's in place. Using the other hose, connect this port to the regulator flow meter. Now this is a floating ball style flow meter and you need to have gas flowing to be able to see the flow rate by looking at the bottom location of the ball. You usually do this by activating the post flow in TIG welding mode and set this as a good starting point to about two and a half times your cup size. Next, let's look at the power connection. You can plug the machine directly into a 240 volt outlet or use the included adapter to plug it into a 120 volt outlet and the machine will automatically adjust to the input voltage. Now we can load wire in the machine. Here inside the machine, there's a spool holder and that accepts eight inch spools of wire in this particular machine. Most spools of wire will have a hole that will engage with the pin on the machine as you load it. With the wire in place, you can secure it with the nut. Next, we can adjust the brake to avoid free spooling right here. There's a thumb screw that also takes a flat blade screwdriver in the center, and you can tighten that to keep it from free spooling, but still keep it sufficiently loose that it can be moved easily with one finger. Now let's look at the feeding mechanism itself. By releasing the idler roller, you can access the drive roll, which is removed with this thumb screw. There are different types of drive rolls for different types of wire. Let's look at each one of them, beginning with the standard drive roll that's included with the base model machine. There are no letters, only the numbers on the sides, and it has deep, narrow grooves to be able to feed solid steel wire. Next, let's look at the roller for aluminum. It has an A to indicate that it's made for aluminum, and if you look at the grooves themselves, they're a much wider groove to be able to feed the softer aluminum wire. The shape of these grooves reduces the pressure that's applied on the soft aluminum wire to avoid deforming it. The final type of roller is indicated with the letter R. It's a knurled roller that is able to feed flux cord tubular wires. The numbers on the side of the drive rolls indicate the size of the groove in tenths of a millimeter, and you'll notice that there are two for the two grooves. The corresponding size in inches to use with each of these grooves is shown on the screen. The number that's visible after the drive roll is installed is the number for the wire to be used. With the proper drive roll installed, the wire is ready to be clipped and then fed through the wire guides over the groove in the drive roll. Lower the idler and secure it with the pressure knob. Now the idler pressure will depend on the type of wire that you're using as shown on the screen here. I'll set mine between two and three for the solid steel wire. Then double check to make sure that it's just barely tight enough that it won't slip with a little pressure from a gloved hand or if it's fed against a wood block like this. Now let's look at some of the nuances when loading aluminum wire. With aluminum wire in place, I won't set my spool brake to be quite as tight, allowing it to spin a little more freely than with a spool of steel wire. Also, the end of the aluminum wire needs to be straightened to be able to feed down through the guides and out through the end of the gun. With aluminum wire, it's also recommended to set the idler pressure low so that the drive roll will actually slip on the wire if it gets jammed. There are multiple MIG welding guns that can be used with this machine. This is the standard MIG welding gun and it's generally used for welding steel with solid or flux core wires. This is the aluminum gun. It has some heavy duty components up here in the neck to be able to handle the heat of welding that aluminum. And it also has a larger diameter, slightly shorter lead with a special liner to feed the soft wire. Since the wire is already loaded, ensure that it is fed down into the liner and secure the MIG gun with the nut. This takes care of your gas and electrical connections all at once. You can typically feed wire through a contact tip, but to ensure that it feeds at the end, I'm going to remove the tip here and set the machine to MIG manual mode. There's a button here labeled inch, and by pressing that, it will feed wire 
and I'll feed it down through the lead and out the MIG gun. Install the proper size contact tip for the wire that I'm using and reinstall the nozzle onto the end of the MIG gun. After clipping the wire, the MIG gun is ready to weld. Let's look at the other connections here on the front of the machine from left to right. Right here, I'll connect the DINs connector for my TIG torch. This is also the connector you'd use for stick welding. Next to that is the gas connection for the TIG torch, followed by the remote, which is typically a foot pedal for TIG welding. However, you can also connect an optional sliding remote for MIG welding or stick welding to the same port. Finally, we'll connect the work clamp on the right. Because the polarity for each process is set electronically within the machine, the work clamp can remain here for all modes of operation. With the machine set up, let's take a quick look at the front panel. The mode button cycles through the different welding processes that this machine's capable of. The knob on the left adjusts amperage or wire feed speed depending on your process, and that's displayed in the corresponding readout. The knob on the right adjusts voltage, which is also displayed in a readout on the right. The function of each of the four flexible buttons is shown at the bottom of the display right here. The gear icon indicates a settings menu, and the settings in this menu apply throughout all modes of operation. Well, that's how to set up the HDP Revolution 2500. In the following videos, we'll go over the operation for each of the processes that this machine is capable of.